Good day, friends. Petra, home of the Edomites, a thousand colorful temples carved out of the solid rock. This is a highlight for any visitor to the Middle East. As Francois guides us through this unique place, we will once again discover this place is not only loaded with this interesting history, but has valuable lessons for each and every one. Our final destination will be a visit to this fascinating city called Petra, means a rock in Greek. But before arriving at this grand climax, I want to introduce you to some of the other exciting historical places in Jordan. The name Pella reminds one of the birthplace of Alexander the Great in Greece, but this particular ancient city is found near the Jordan Valley. Let's visit the guest house. Down below you see some of the remaining ruins from this once famous city. It was amazing to see a spring of water gushing from this barren area. In the time of Jesus, Pella was one of the ten cities called Decapolis. When I walked amongst these ruins, I was reminded of a verse in Matthew 24 verse 20, where Jesus told his disciples to pray a very specific prayer concerning the future destruction of the city of Jerusalem. Let's read it. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Historians tell us that their prayers were answered and that they fled to Pella on the Wednesday in the month of November before winter set in. More about this amazing fulfillment of prophecy in a later lecture. On our way to Petra we visit a few more interesting places. For years I dreamt of visiting the site on the eastern side of the Dead Sea called Machaurus or Mukavir. You have a magnificent view of the Dead Sea from here. This fortress was built by Herod the Great and later occupied by his son Herod Antipas, also called Herod the Tetrarch. It was on this very site that John the Baptist was beheaded by Herod. Why? Because he preached the Elijah message. Herod was also the king who questioned Jesus on the Friday morning before his crucifixion. Archaeologists made a tremendous breakthrough a few years ago when they excavated and identified the cave where they believed Lot lived after he fled the destruction of the beautiful cities of the once fertile Jordan Valley. And they've also identified the sites of ancient Sodom and Gomorrah called Bapedra and Nuveira. Have you ever thought why these sites are being excavated and identified in our age? On our way to Petra, we drive through Wadi Mujib, the biblical Arnon. In ancient times, it was the boundary between Moab and Ammon. The Bible speaks about Mount Seir, where the Edomites built their capital. Today, it's called Petra. What a sight! Nowhere in the world does one see an entrance to a city like this one. The Arabs call this 1.2 kilometer gorge that leads to the city S Sik. This is the kind of colorful sandstone you see on your way to Esau's capital. Every time I visit Petra, I have a greater appreciation for the great artist, God, who made this colorful city. As you approach the end of the 1.2 kilometer sick, it becomes progressively darker. So typical of life. What shall we do? Go back to where we last saw the light or move forward in the dark? By faith, let's move forward. When I stood here the first time, I thought of the darkness of depression, rejection, guilt, and at times the darkness of the meaninglessness of life. There is only one thing we can do in times like these, and that is to penetrate the darkness with faith. When we move forward, we will not only see light at the end of a very dark tunnel, we will also see the beautiful temple. If you are experiencing some darkness in your life, then the S. Sik of Petra invites you to press on till you come to life's temples of contentment and joy. This beautiful temple carved out of solid rock is called El Kazna Farun. The Arabs who lived here during the previous century thought the urn was filled with Pharaoh's treasures and they shot at it. 
While stonemasons chiseled on this rock, it remained passive in spite of pain. And just look at the end result. So ladies, when your husband causes you a little discomfort, you might consider him a chisel in your life, which may eventually produce beauty of character. So please ladies, be patient with us men, and remember, men are made to be loved and not to be understood. So with these sobering thoughts in mind, let's move on and explore the beauty and majesty of this fantastic city. We're on our way to the huge amphitheater. This beautiful amphitheater, carved out of solid rock, seats 5,000 people. Just above the top seats are some rock-hewn tombs. Let's climb up there and do some more investigation. What an exquisite, beautiful, colorful sight. They were made by the wealthy people of Petra who wanted to watch the programs down below after their departure. But they fooled themselves because Ecclesiastes 9 verse 4 says, The dead know not anything. So please enjoy the good things of life while you are still alive. Real people like you and me used to live here in ancient times. They also enjoyed the beautiful colors. The beauty is still there, but the Horites, the Edomites and the Nemeteans are all gone. The hill over there is called Um El Bayara. Very interesting ruins dating from the time of the Edomites, descendants of Esau, were excavated on the summit. Esau had a twin brother called, can you recall his name, Jacob. The descendants of Esau and Jacob became two great nations, the Edomites and the Israelites. Humble Jacob preferred staying in his land of birth, but Esau was looking for a more exciting place to live. So he defeated the Horites and made Petra his home. 2 Kings 14.7 tells how King Amaziah of Judah, a descendant of Jacob, captured the very hill that you're looking at. He was the one who defeated 10,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt and captured Selah in battle. Listen to the words of the prophet Jeremiah while you're looking at the very place he saw in vision. Jeremiah 49 verse 16. The terror you inspire and the pride of your heart have deceived you. You live in the clefts of the rock, who occupy the heights of the hill. Though you build your nest as high as the eagles, from there I will bring you down. While the proud, cruel descendants of Esau were living in his beautiful homes, God was speaking to them through his prophets, through nature, through his Holy Spirit, and through his written word. Why? Because their hearts were filled with pride and pride stops us from finding the blessings of God, the blessings of good health, the blessings of sweet family relationships. Their pride eventually led them to sacrifice their own children. As I walked here, I thought of God's great love and care in trying to save people. When they rejected God's call to repentance through his prophet Jeremiah, God sent the prophet Ezekiel with another warning. I will make Mount Seir a desolate waste and cut off from it all who come and go. This comes from Ezekiel 35 verse 7. I think the inhabitants of Petra scorned this prophecy because there was no way in which any enemy could get into this fortress that was surrounded by mountains on every side. How did Petra become a desolate place like the prophecy predicted? It was simply economics. The caravan routes were diverted and Petra became a deserted fortress. What an amazing fulfillment of Bible prophecy. I wonder how many tourists visiting Petra know about the many Bible passages concerning this place. Do they know about God's persistent love that does not want people to perish? but that all should come to a knowledge of his saving grace. Did you know that an entire Old Testament book was devoted to call the proud, cruel, sinful Edomites of Petra to repentance? Let me read verse 3 from the book of the prophet Obadiah. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You live in the clefts of the rocks and made your home on the heights. You who say to yourself, 
Who can bring me down to the ground? Proud people tend to be a little unsympathetic at times. They compare their spiritual accomplishments with others and they feel a bit superior. Proud people are tempted to think that their righteous deeds have meritorious value with God. May God help the humblest of us not to be proud of our humbleness. I took this picture from one of the proud but desolate homes of Petra. Listen to verse 4 of Obadiah chapter 1. Though you soar like the eagle and make your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. How true, pride always precedes a fall. Let's make a comparison between Esau of Petra and his descendants the Edomites with Jacob and his descendants the Israelites. One is lost and the other saved. Genesis 25 verse 23 Two nations are in your womb, and two people from within you will be separated. In a literal sense, Esau and Jacob represent the Edomites and the Israelites. But in a spiritual sense, they represent the saved and the lost. Let's learn a few lessons from their experiences. In Genesis 25, we read how Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of lentil stew. Verse 34 says, So Esau despised his birthright. He rejected the spiritual responsibilities of the birthright, which called him to a dedicated life of unselfishness, which bears the fruit of kindness towards others. Now Jacob was no saint. He deceived his father by saying that he was Esau in order to receive the blessings of the birthright, which was reserved for Esau, the firstborn. Fortunately, God is in the business of saving and changing people. Here at the ancient site of Bethel, God gave Jacob a dream which changed his life. This happened after this guilt-ridden sinner had to flee in shame from home because his deceived brother Esau wanted to kill him. Let's read about it. Genesis 28 verse 12 says, He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth, with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Who is represented by this ladder? In his conversation with Nathanael, Jesus said, You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This comes from John 1 verse 51. The ladder represents Jesus, the appointed medium of communication. Had he not with his own merits bridged the gulf that sin had made, the ministering angels could have held no communion with fallen man. Christ connected man in his weakness and helplessness with a source of infinite power. This comes from the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 184. If you have slipped away from God... Just remember, Christ is the ladder on which all the goodness of heaven is brought to you, his forgiveness and his healing. One evening here at Jabok River, after returning from Mesopotamia, a stranger attacked Jacob. At first he thought it was his brother taking revenge on him. Let's read more about it. Genesis 32 verses 25 and 26 when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Here at the Jabbok River, I thought of a statement I once read about Jacob's struggle that night. Through humiliation, repentance and self-surrender, this sinful, erring mortal prevailed with the majesty of heaven. He had fastened his trembling grasp upon the promises of God and the heart of infinite love could not turn away the sinner's plea. 
Just look at this beautiful rock at Petra. The ugly Jacob fell on the beautiful rock of ages, Jesus Christ. His sinful, ugly, selfish hardness was broken and Jacob changed into a kind man. The Lord changed his name from Jacob the deceiver to Israel, meaning he who rules with God. But his proud brother Esau, who made Petra his capital, refused to fall on the rock. He tried to please God on his own terms, and he remained unconverted. You're looking at a very rare site at Zip Atuf at Petra. Obelisks were usually built in the vicinity of sacrificial high places. These two represent the gods of Dushara and El Uzzah. God told the Israelites that they had to smash their sacred pillars when they come to Canaan, Exodus 23 verse 24. Why? They represented the beams of light and were therefore connected with a cruel ritual of sun worship. But that's not all. They were phallic symbols and thus part of a fertility cult, too debasing to even mention. Before showing you the sacrificial high place at Petra, let me quickly take you to a very interesting archaeological site in Israel called the Gezer. What do you see? Cultic pillars. And what can we expect to find in this area? A high place of sacrifice. I asked my friend Professor Walter Feit to lie on the altar at this specific high place to illustrate how humans were sacrificed at this very same spot. Just below these cultic pillars, archaeologists discovered several caves filled with ash and bones of men, women, children and infants. Unbelievable. Let me show you another high place at Chazor where this cruelty was practiced. God told Israel in Numbers 33 verse 52, Destroy all their carved images and their cast idols and demolish all their high places. Deuteronomy 7 verse 6 tells us why they had to do it. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. Now let me tell you what happened at Petra on the day of sacrifice. In one of the beautiful homes in Wadi Faraza, the sun priests tell a young virgin that she will be offered to the sun gods of Petra. In vain do the parents try to persuade the priests to take another virgin from Wadi Thugra. For an entire night she gets locked up in one of these temples. Originally they sacrificed animals. But one of their gods told them that in order to appease his anger, they had to sacrifice their most beautiful virgin. Long before daybreak, the priests lead her up these stairs to the high place of sacrifice. It is a most colorful route. But when you face death, beauty somehow loses its attraction. Why do the gods want me to die? she asks them. Because of the sins of the people, they tell her. And the only way we can appease his anger is by sacrificing the most beautiful virgin in Petra. As I climbed these very steps to the summit of Jabal Matba, where virgins were sacrificed, I thought of our loving God. He does not expect me to sacrifice my child in order to receive the forgiveness of sin. Instead, he gave his son to die in my stead, thus providing salvation full and free. The beautiful red color of this Petra home reminded me of what 1 John chapter 1 verse 7 says. The blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. This is the good news of the gospel. Christ was treated as I deserve so that I can be treated as he deserves. Sun priests ascend the last few steps to the summit of Jabal Matba. Jabal, by the way, means mountain. The young victim is agonizing, pleading for mercy. She is brought to this flat altar in the middle of the open space. You're looking at the biggest and best preserved sacrificial high place in the Middle East. Strong priests place their sacrifice on this flat altar. 
One of them draws a sharp sacrificial knife. She screams frantically. Down below in Wadi Faraza, a father and a mother hear their daughter's voice for the last time. Her death cries pierce the early morning air. And then as the sun rises, her familiar voice becomes silent forever. Here at El Matba, the high place of sacrifice, one of the priests is waiting for the sun rays to lighten the top of the sun pillar. This was to be the time signal for sacrificing a human being to appease the angry sun god. A sharp knife disappears in a chest and cuts out her heart which is placed in this sun disc. What a dreadful religion. I took a close-up of this little furrow in which her blood trickled down. They believed that the human blood which flowed here was so powerful it changed the attitude of the angry god. Here at El Madba, the ancient high place of sacrifice, a human heart was placed in this sun disc in order to win the favor of the sun god. But just outside Jerusalem on a hill called Calvary, Christ died of a broken heart in order to win our favor, change our attitude and grant us salvation. What a theme for contemplation now and throughout eternity. After sacrificing her heart to the sun god, they burned her body on this altar. The smoke ascended up into the air and the wind swept it away. Loved ones down below in Wadi Faraza looked up and saw the smoke from the sacrificial body of their beloved daughter disappearing into the blue skies. Can you imagine their heartbrokenness? When this cruel ceremony was completed, the priests washed their blood-stained hands in this pool of so-called holy water and believed that they were fully forgiven. But they were not, because there is nothing you and I can do to cleanse us from our past sins. But, says one hymn writer William Cowper, there is a fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Before I left El Matba, I took this slide of the sun pillar in the foreground with Aaron's tomb in the background. They symbolize two religions in the world. The false is represented by this sun pillar and says that you must bring a human sacrifice in order to be saved. The other religion represented by Aaron says no. You don't have to die for your sins. Someone else has already died in your place. All you have to do is to offer this Lamb, Jesus Christ, to the Father, and you are forgiven. In a future lecture on Daniel 9, I would like to spend more time studying the beautiful plan of salvation as illustrated by the ceremonial system during Israel's desert wanderings. Walking back to my little Avis car, and watching these beautiful, colourful rocks, I thought of the many broken-hearted people who lived here at Petra. My thoughts especially went out to the daughter of King Arietas who lived here during the time of Christ. She fell in love with a man called Herod Antipas, who came from a place called Mukavir. She dreamt of a happy marriage, but after 25 years he left her for another. Eventually, Huldu, the broken-hearted divorcee, returned to Petra. Many times she thought of that specific day when he said to her in an awkward voice, I'm in love with Herodias, my brother Philip's wife. When I visited Mukavir and saw the rooms where this marital tragedy took place, I thought of so many men, women and children who were damaged emotionally by the cruelty of unfaithfulness and divorce. So many people who used to live in these beautiful homes in Petra were hurting. Many of them went hurting to their graves. And many of us are hurting behind our smile. It could be a loneliness. Too many disappointments at one time tends to make life meaningless. Maybe you have lost a loved one. You may be hurting because of a relationship that is breaking up or has already broken up. I'm so thankful for someone very kind and understanding who knows about our troubled hearts. 
Listen to his solution to our pain problem. John 14 verses 1 to 3 Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. There is healing and comfort in God's beautiful promises. We saw some beautiful homes in Petra. But I want to tell you that God is preparing homes for us in heaven beyond our comprehension or wildest imagination. There will be no tissues in those homes because we will never cry again. Thoughts of a painless future brings tremendous healing. Heaven's homes, unlike the homes of Petra, will be happy homes. Homes without suffering, or without dying loved ones. Homes where no child will ask, Mommy, why has Daddy left us? There's no disappointment in heaven. No tear ever moistens the eye. Listen to this comforting Bible promise. Revelation 21 verse 4 He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or Pain for the old order of things has passed away. Esau, one of the builders of this great city, wanted to impress God and man by his architectural achievements. His effort to earn salvation by his selfish deeds made him cruel, callous and haughty. The beauty of the colourful rock face of the treasury invites us to behold the beauty of another rock, the Rock of Ages. And when we discover the ample provisions that God has already made for our salvation in Christ, we become humble, soft, kind-hearted and loving children of God. And by the way, a loving and a lovable Christian is the greatest argument in favour of Christianity. I sincerely hope you have enjoyed this journey through Petra. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for the Rock of Ages who went to prepare a beautiful place for us. Help us to be faithful to him until we see him on the clouds of heaven. Amen. I'm looking forward to the next presentation as it concerns the most fascinating city in the world, Jerusalem.